มุตัสสะปะคะวะทวรหัตโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมตัสสะปะคะวะทวรหัตโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมตัสสะปะคะวะทวรหัตโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะปุถังธรรมังสังขังนมัสสามิน้ำ blessings good evening ever since I first became a Buddhist monk there's two particular themes that I picked up in the teachings from the Buddha and from l u m p o r Cha, my teacher, later from l u m p o r Anan, that have been very um, helpful, insightful for me personally, but I think also for many, many Buddhist practitioners in the in learning about you know, the human mind and how to understand the Four Noble Truths. Where suffering comes from and what to do about it. Those two themes are: first is uh, metta, goodwill; and the second is panya, wisdom. So there's something we call uh, metta panya vimuti. Vimuti means liberation of mind, liberation from the causes of suffering. Greed, anger, delusion, and particularly the the qualities of metta, goodwill, loving kindness, and panya, wisdom or insight into the true nature of phenomena, and they work together, and they're two parts of the whole, two parts of the same thing, but they're just slightly different qualities that we cultivate in our Practice, and not just in meditation, but in daily life. You know, really, there's no way around it. If you are going to follow the Buddhist teachings, and you've you found found them inspiring, you've heard the Buddha's words, you've read them, and you found them inspiring. You want to follow the Buddha or the Buddhist path. Then these two. Aspects are essential to develop, and in all all aspects of our life. So, metta, the goodwill, you, know, you have to want to improve yourself from a place of goodwill. Will, if you want to free your mind from suffering, you know, it has to be a basic well-wishing for yourself. The very opposite of self-harm or wishing yourself harm, but you also need the insight, the wisdom, the understanding to succeed in freeing, freeing your mind from suffering, to both prevent suffering arising and also to deal with it if it has arisen. So these two qualities we cultivate together in our daily life. So uh, a very good way to do that is to begin your day is to practice metta bhavana, cultivation of loving kindness as you get up in the morning, and to make that aspiration. It's what we call right aspiration, samma sankapa, the aspiration to abandon thoughts rooted in ill will, anger, and aversion, and cultivate. Thoughts, aspirations, in, based in goodwill, and starting with ourselves, because who do you know best <laughs> yourself? Who do you experience first in this life? Or yourself. Who do you know best? Yourself. The way modern society is, you know, we can know so much about the rest of the world, other people in the world around us. 
but all that knowledge tends to be rather superficial if we're honest whereas the, the place we can really know or start to know clearly and in detail is our own body and mind so that's where our practice of goodwill kindness has to begin and where it can be most effective Sometimes when we are really upset with ourselves and annoyed with ourselves, well, maybe it is easier to bring up the thought of kindness towards others. And that certainly can energize us as we go through our, our life. You know, sometimes we find it easier to arouse energy to help somebody else. And we often, uh, and we like to put ourselves down or ignore ourselves or even criticize ourselves. But when you bring up mindfulness and start looking at your life, what you do really know, well, it is yourself that you know first, isn't it? You, how you feel, what you're thinking, how your body is, how your mind is, your emotional state. That's what you can really know well in this life. And that's where you can, where the practice of metta or developing the thought of goodwill can be really effective you know, even if we do hear about other people suffering and we might have that thought to help others how much can you really know about another person's suffering you can maybe see the external symptoms if you know somebody who's stressed unhappy, ill maybe you can have a basic idea of their problem and what's going on in their mind and their body but you don't really feel it, do you? You can only feel your own pain, your own suffering. The pain of others you can only sense in a very basic way or guess at or assume that they're experiencing some suffering because you, they tell you or you see it but when it's yourself, you know it because you can feel it and you really can know it very closely from your own experience. So this is why the practice of metta, goodwill and really the whole Buddhist path has to begin from within. That doesn't mean to say there's no place for helping others, of course there is. And sometimes helping others we get to know ourselves a little bit better as well. But you know, if you're in pain, you are the one who feels that. If your mind is confused, you're the one experiencing that confusion, that aversion, that fear, the worry, whatever the experience of suffering, you're the one experiencing that. And others can only guess at it, maybe going on what you say. Then we also, because of our habit, we often we have, because we have built up habits of self-aversion, and that's often the first thing you encounter when you practice goodwill directed to yourself. You often, you'll notice if you're meditating, developing the thought of kindness towards yourself, wishing yourself well, wishing yourself success, freedom from stress, there'll be another voice in the mind that says, no, I don't deserve this, why me? I'm no good. Uh, it's very common. Um, and we have to get over that, that hurdle, and recognize that if we can develop goodwill for ourselves, it will naturally flow on to other people. And our relations with others and our ability to help others will improve. So in the end, as we practice, then they're not, it's not really, um, it's not as if helping yourself or developing kindness towards yourself is um, somehow going to be to the disadvantage of others. It's not being selfish, and that's often the thought we have, oh, if I, I just look after myself, develop goodwill for myself, you know, I'm going to be ignoring others or selfish towards others. 
what, perhaps what you have to see is that it's liberating your mind from a lot of negativity when you cultivate the thought of metta. You know, metta, when it's in the mind, goodwill is in the mind, anger cannot exist at that point, at that moment. So you're naturally cleansing the mind of anger when you bring up goodwill for yourself. And if you're really to love others and help others, well, you also have to be able to do it for yourself. And much of the Buddhist teachings are based on this principle. You have to love others, you have to love yourself. To help others, you have to help yourself. To know others and understand others, you have to know and understand yourself. Why? Because we can. We can know ourselves. And we should know ourselves. Because we're in the best position to know ourselves. <laughs> It'd be nice to, if there were someone else around who really loves us and knows us like ourselves or better than ourselves. And sometimes it seems that, like with, particularly with teachers, if you have a good teacher, often they seem to be a little smarter or wiser, more experienced than you. They may seem to know you better than yourself. But even then, all they can do is point you back to the truth, to the Dhamma. And they can't feel your suffering if you're experiencing suffering. You feel that. If you're ill, you feel that discomfort or the pain, the tiredness, whatever, it, whatever the symptoms are. Someone else may know that you're ill, they recognize that and they may sympathize with you and they may do what they can to help you. But the feeling of pain you feel. And so that's why you should develop kindness for yourself on a regular basis because that's the first place that it's needed in your life. So as we practice developing the mind through these Buddhist teachings, using them, applying them, to and we bring up metta, goodwill, over and over again. Just to, the idea is to get, to get it so it's just a normal way of cultivating the mind. And it's not a, you know, a blurry kind of fuzzy, idealistic, just having love for all beings. Uh, and we are aiming to develop unconditional love. So love, goodwill, without any seeking anything in return, without any binding conditions or any expectations. We are doing that, but we're also aware that you know, people are different and situations that we find ourselves in will vary and sometimes we're with people who are difficult or sometimes we ourselves are being difficult and we kind of half know it and we're being stubborn or falling into negative, unskillful ways and we're half aware of it but we haven't given, given up that attachment yet. So it's not like we're just expecting our mind to change and the whole world to kind of melt into a, <laughs> uh, a thought of loving kindness. You know, the way you express metta, goodwill will vary depending on the situation. But there's always coming back to genuine well-wishing. But how it's applied will depend also on experience and wisdom. And that's why metta and panya go together. It comes partly through experience. I remember Ajahn Chah used to say he, he gained most of his wisdom from the time when he started his monastery. Wapapong, where he lived and practiced until he died from I think about 1954. He first settled in the forest in uh, um, near his home village of Bangor. He came back to, at the request of his f mother and relatives, to just settle in the forest there so that they could offer him, him arms and practice with him, receive teachings. So from that day, until he died, so about 40 years or so. He lived at the monastery. And he said he gained the most wisdom from 
living and teaching people there. So it's with wisdom that your metta maybe expands out through experience, through putting it into practice, it may expand out into the world and you, you learn more about other people, the world, and then maybe yourself. They go together very well. But the very starting point probably has to be goodwill, doesn't it? To, to practice what the Buddha taught, you have to wish yourself well. You want to improve, you want to be free from suffering. Otherwise, it's not really necessary. You don't need the Buddhist teachings if you don't want to be free from suffering. Uh, and sometimes we're so deluded that we actually are indulging our suffering or feel we deserve it and it should just be this way. It's always going to be this way. You know, when we're very negative, depressed, disappointed, often we kind of accept suffering and sometimes even want suffering. When your mind is in a really deluded state, we occasionally even want to harm ourselves and just want suffering, want pain. But when you realize that, one, that there is a way out of suffering, and two, that it should be developed, then that's the beginning of goodwill, isn't it? That aspiration to improve, to get out of suffering. And as you're doing it for yourself, well, then you also open up and start to realize other people also need the same. So as you learn about yourself through the practice, then you start to learn about other people. And what you see in yourself, you can see in other people. You see some of the common experiences we do have. But still, you only really know yourself, don't you? Who do you love yourself? Who who do you love the best? It's, first of all, it has to be yourself. Like the Queen, uh, it Queen Malika in the time of the Buddha, and the King asked her, "Who do you love most?" And he was disappointed to hear her say, "Myself." And then checking with the Buddha, the Buddha said, "Well, that's correct." We love ourselves the best. You see that every time you experience pain, you say your leg hurts, and you, you say you're sitting on the ground, your leg hurts, and you want to move it. You, you move your leg first before you move someone else's leg because you don't really know whether they're experiencing pain or not or how much pain. Or you touch something that's hot, burning hot, and you pull your hand back immediately. It's just instinctive to protect yourself and f want to be free from pain and suffering. So the Buddhist path begins with metta, but then it's developed and cultivated with panya, with wisdom. So they grow together. And so I sometimes people who have families, you know, they say, "Oh, I can't practice what the, the, the practice the Dhamma. I can't practice meditation very well. I've got a family to look after." And sometimes they come and talk to monks in the forest or in the monastery, and they say, "Oh, you, it's all right for you. You're, I'm in the real world. I got a family to look after. I got a job to do. I earn money. Look after my kids. You don't really know what it's like." Well, there's some truth to that. Living as a monk in the forest, you, you, you don't have to worry about kids. That's one, one less burden on the mind. Um, if you're in a family situation, you have one kid or many kids, that's, that is a responsibility and it can be quite a burden on the mind. But at the same time, it's something you can learn from, isn't it? If you cultivate it as part of the practice, Looking after kids, looking after a sick parent or a sick relative, whatever your situation, those responsibilities can also be a place you learn as you apply metta for yourself and then to those people, to those kids, and you gain wisdom. Some of those lessons you gain helping the people around you in your family may be quite painful. <laughs> but Nevertheless, they're lessons. That's wisdom, isn't it? And wisdom is for life. True wisdom, true insight sticks with you for life. It's not, not just a, it's not the same as 
information you just memorize, you know, like when you're in your schooling, your education, or learning new um, skills in life. Sometimes you notice how you, you learn something and then a, a few years later you've forgotten it. True wisdom, true insight sticks with you. Life lessons, you might say. And so bringing up a family, or looking after a sick relative, whatever it may be, you often are learning lessons that stick with you and you really understand more about yourself and other people from it. And so there's still merit and good karma to be made there. It's not like a hopeless situation, <laughs> which is often how people think about it. They say, I can't practice the Dhamma because I've got kids. Well, the kids are your practice, aren't they, if, you, if that's your life situation. You can learn from looking after kids, taking responsibility for them, thinking what it is that you want to pass on to them, give to them. And it's not just a material thing, is it? We've got knowledge and Dhamma to pass on to them. What kind of Dhamma are you passing on to them? Your dhamma just means truth. So what kind of truth do you pass on to your kids? Or your sick relative? If that's your lot in life, you've, you've got into a situation where you have to look after someone who's sick and you think, oh, I haven't got any chance to meditate, I can't practice the Dhamma, I can't go out because I've got to be with them. Well, that becomes your practice. And the same principles of developing loving kindness and cultivating wisdom and insight apply. So if you're looking after someone who's sick, whether it's in your work, you're in healthcare, or it's a family member, or even a friend sometimes, what kind of attitude are you bringing to that task? And there's always scope to learn from it, learn about yourself, learn about others. Whether it's dealing with the sick, dealing with a child, are you doing it with a, an attitude of reluctance, <laughs> resistance, or even just plain aversion? Uh, or are you taking it in as part of your practice and they become your practice? They become your teacher. So these qualities of metta and panya, wisdom, understanding, they're universal qualities that really can be cultivated at all times, in all situations. They're not just for monks to develop in the forest or spiritual seekers when they're on retreat. Even in the ordinary life situation of running a family, looking after your relatives, earning a living, going to work. These are qualities that we are aiming to develop all the time. And wisdom you know, comes particularly from contemplating you know, the impermanence of life, the changing nature of body and mind and the world around us. And from that seeing the dukkha of change. You know, things don't last so they can't bring us lasting happiness. So you may go to work and you have to accept well, this. The people I work with, they don't last forever. You know, they, they move on or they get older, they retire, one day they'll get sick, one day they'll die, they won't be there. Someone else will be doing that job. Whatever it is you're involved with in your job, you know, the buildings and the people and the different parts, aspects of that job will constantly be changing. And as you do that job, you get tired. And there's dukkha that comes from just expending physical and mental energy doing a job. Just the same as looking after a family. It's, there's dukkha involved. It's tiring. Things change. People grow up. People won't be there forever. They won't be the same forever. Even from day to day we change, even from hour to hour. We're changing, aren't we? People's moods change and sometimes you can't be quite sure what's coming next because of change and then dukkha. 
And because of that, you have, we have to say well, it's not self. Things go according to causes and conditions. And ultimately we can't control them. We control things the best we can. We do whatever we can to improve the world and, and you know, make it convenient for ourselves, for others. But ultimately you can't control things. So it's not self. This is the way we develop wisdom, by bringing up those perceptions in daily life. You know, the Buddha said, the perception of impermanence counters the delusion of permanence. You know, how often do we fool ourselves thinking something will last longer than it can, or will just last indefinitely? You know? How many times, who, who really, when they get a new job, do they really consider, oh, one day I won't be doing this job? You're not thinking like that, are you? You get a new job, you're thinking, I'm going to do this, and I want to get on and get a promotion and do this well and get get it, get into it. You're not thinking of impermanence much. Who's thinking, when you have a baby and you bring up your child, who's thinking, oh, one day this child, I'll separate from it? My daughter, my son, one day we'll separate. We'll go our separate ways through, first of all, just through aging and you grow up and you move house and move apart ultimately through death who's really thinking of that but this is wisdom and this is what you get from living your life and reflecting on these simple truths the fact that where we see permanence as actually impermanence where we keep expecting and hoping for happiness as we keep getting disappointed because dukkha comes along and where we seek to control and own and, and take ownership of experience and things and people, there's actually a lack of self in them. We don't own them, we don't control them. Wisdom is what breaks through delusion. And delusion, just like we often are lacking metta as our starting point, we have a lot of pain and aversion and negativity in our minds, so we need to cultivate metta, goodwill. We have a lot of delusion, confusion, wrong thinking that we need to deal with by cultivating wisdom. Wisdom that sees impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and the lack of self in experience. It's not just these are just not just perceptions you develop on the meditation mat, although you can do them very well there. Just as we go through our life, noticing the impermanence of things, the changing nature of our daily experience brings wisdom, and wisdom frees the mind from all kinds of suffering. Suffering based on wrong thinking, attachment to wrong views of things, wrong expectations. Wrong, I simply mean, is you know, delusion, <laughs> it's because it causes suffering. Always expecting things to be better than they are, different than they are. Our mind is very tricky, very deluding. So we need to develop wisdom, we need to contemplate things and reflect on things to counter that. There's no way around it. But it's liberating. You know? Wisdom liberates us from delusions. It matures the mind. In the, you might call the Buddhist path a path of developing maturity or maturing our, our attitudes, our views, the way we look at the world so that we start to see it as truth from the place of truth rather than a place of delusion and false expectations misunderstandings so true wisdom always liberates the mind just like metta liberates the mind from negativity wisdom liberates the mind from confusion and delusion it brings the mind to peace Sometimes that's just from listening and reflecting on Dhamma. Sometimes it's 
most effectively is when you actually apply your mind, the Dhamma that you've heard, you actually apply your mind to look for it and notice it and understand it from your own experience. And to know that your own body is subject to change and you can't control that half the time. You can't stop your body aging and catching COVID or whatever other illness you may be subject to. Most of the time you can't stop that happening when it happens. Of course we can pre practice preventative medicine and try to live a healthy life. But when we do get ill or we just face aging, you really can't stop that, can you? Because that's the way things are. So bringing your mind in line with the truth, recognizing this is the way things are, is wisdom. It frees your mind from suffering. Knowing that you won't be here one day, the people you love won't be here one day. This is wisdom. And far from making us indifferent to the world, it makes you more caring of the people around you, of yourself and others, because you know your, your life in this world is precious. We're not here for that long. So every day counts, every moment counts, and our relationships count because we won't be here forever. You know, the Buddha put a lot of emphasis on reflecting on impermanence and the selfless nature of things and the fact that we won't be here forever because it brings wisdom to the mind. It's not always immediately attractive, is it? And we, it tends to make us feel depressed when we think of impermanence and change and death, but you have to see these are liberating insights as well that bring the mind to peace when we can accept the truth. But you're not going to accept the truth necessarily in just like that. You know, a few people who are very advanced and mature in their insight and the way they look at the world maybe quite quickly come to this conclusion. You know, they can see the world is impermanent, their mind is impermanent, other people are impermanent. For most people it's a gradual process, a gradual awakening to the way things are and you have to keep applying yourself, keep reflecting on the truths to bring up the wisdom. But when it arises it brings peace to the mind because you know this is the way things are and your mind accepts the truth. Sometimes our kids learn things quicker than us or their mind is just a little clearer than us. So it's another way you learn, isn't it? If you do have a family, you have, you have kids. Sometimes they, they see the Dhamma much quicker than us because we're so, we develop so many complicated attachments and our wisdom sort of goes into the background and we're just sort of stuck in the drive, the activities of life and the drive of just working, doing things, looking after the household, looking after the kids that we forget ourselves, we forget the wisdom of the Buddha, we forget ourselves and then a, sometimes our children remind us in the, the thick of it and they say, oh, mum, dad, <laughs> chill, <laughs> let go, <laughs> calm down, it's all right. And their, their, their wisdom is just as valid as ours but often you know, because we see them as children we don't recognize it maybe because we're stuck in our perception uh, I'm the parent, I know better. But sometimes they know better because they can see us suffering. So they can actually help us. <laughs> they can help us to calm down, relax when we're agitated, worried, angry. And sometimes they just see the impermanence of things. They haven't built up so, such strong attachment to the world so they, they tell you, oh, it's impermanent, live with it. It's almost like they're, they're teaching us the truth. We just don't want to accept it because it's a kid. <laughs> it's our kid. They shouldn't be teaching us. But maybe they actually have some wisdom. Not always. Sometimes we have the wisdom too. But even children can see and understand things. They ask good questions. Often adults have stopped asking questions about things, haven't they? They stopped looking for wisdom. They're just stuck in their habits and they're going to give it up on that part of life, the spiritual part of life, and they're just saying, oh, my job is just to make ends meet and pay the bills. Shut up. <laughs> Stop telling me the Dhamma. 
but maybe the kid has a more open mind because they you know they're fresh in the in their eyes are fresh the way they're looking at the world it's like in the time of the buddha the weaver's daughter you know the story of the weaver's daughter she was only a young girl but she was very mature in her attitude to the world and that morning the buddha the buddha was meditating in his normal way and he surveyed the world and he said oh this is the one person who's not so blind they're open to the dhamma today the the weaver's daughter just a young girl he said, surveyed the rest of the world he said oh everyone else is just so blind i can't see anyone who's ripe for the dhamma i can't you know there's no point in going out teaching anyone today no one's ready for it they're just blind they're stuck in their own little world of making money and doing things and working and competing with each other but he noticed the weaver's daughter's mind was very clear open to the dhamma and he had previously given a talk in her town i think it was the alavi people and he previously given a talk on the contemplation of death and impermanence and how we should develop that as a meditation but only the weaver's daughter took it seriously so she was already contemplating it nobody else took that teaching to heart they all said oh yeah that makes sense and then forgot about it <laughs> but she didn't so she was the one with the wisdom going around reflecting on death the impermanence of life even though she's a young girl and just so happens you know the buddha went into town ready to teach her but she didn't turn up because she was busy because she was a good girl loved her father worked for her father he he'd given us her an extra job so she was late she wanted to hear the dhamma hear the buddha but she was late because she had to go on an errand for her father first but the buddha was patient he had no more attachments and doubts and anger and impatience you know, he knew how to wait because he's a buddha he's enlightened so he just sat there waiting eventually the girl turned up and he was she was the one he wanted to teach that day so he gave her a teaching i mean other people could listen but he knew she would be the one who get something from it so he just asked her those four questions where did you come from and she answered don't know where are you going to don't know do you know i don't know do you not know i do know <laughs> all very mysterious and all the supposedly mature adults in the village who were sitting listening got annoyed with the young girl thought that she was just mucking around with the buddha but he he trusted her he was looking at the girl as they come forward so then he further questioned her you you said i asked you where you come from you say you don't know why do you answer like that she said well i don't know because i don't know where i came from before i was born of course she knows where she lives where the house she was coming from but she doesn't know where she was born from where she was before she was born into her mother's womb and do you know where you're going no i don't know well when you die you don't know where you're going to be reborn she didn't know so she answered honestly i don't know where i'm going even though she was on her way to her father's workshop she did she had to answer i don't know because what she really meant or what the buddha meant was do you know where you'll be reborn no i don't know do you know or what well, no, the first question was do you not know i know what was that do you not know that you're going to die i do know that i'm going to die do you know i don't know i know i'm going to die but i don't know when or where so the buddha was doing a guided meditation on impermanence on on death contemplation of death knowing that she would die but not knowing when but knowing for sure she must die not knowing where she came from last life not knowing where she'll be reborn but knowing she'll die so just contemplating like that that was enough wisdom to free her mind from basic attachment to the kandas of self and doubt about the practice so she attained stream entry 
not long after that went home and there was an accident and her father knocked her with the the uh, what do they call it when they weave thread uh, the machine <laughs> the wooden machine that they use for weaving uh, knocked her dead by mistake so she died a stream entra reborn in heaven but such a pertinent story to our our daily life whether in a monastery or in the out in the world looking after our family going to work you, the one thing you know is you're going to die it's the one thing you do know in life you don't know when when that you can't be sure it could be today it could be in a 10 20 30 years time but you know, do know you will die for sure Some such simple direct truth is enough to cut through the delusions of mind, isn't it? When it's coming with a from a place of metta, goodwill, your your aim is to liberate your mind from delusions, so the delusion of seeing things that are impermanent, uh, or seeing things that are permanent, seeing things that are impermanent, seeing them as impermanent. That's one delusion seeing things that are dukkha but seeing them as sukha, happiness is another seeing things that are not self as self is another learning to reflect like this just on the impermanent nature of this world the certainty of death, the uncertainty of life changes your attitudes, it sobers you up, matures you even children can sometimes have this insight and they just know intuitively yeah, that's the way it is things don't last, things change it's hard for kids but it's possible or at least sometimes they have that insight even when we don't so don't underestimate the wisdom of children sometimes they, they see things before us and they see the value of metta maybe they can forgive someone we haven't yet forgiven they don't want to live, you know, especially when they're young, they don't want to live with a mind of anger, hatred. So often they, they're willing to let go of the hatred and the anger quicker. It's like that story when I was growing up and there was a, a bombing in the UK. It's the Irish, I think it was the IRA bombed. Uh, block of apartments I think it was in Manchester and a young girl very young girl only five years old, seven years old she was caught under the rubble her, her house, her home was destroyed but she didn't die but she was caught under the rubble and they had to dig her out and they were racing against time and they couldn't get her out in time, the whole body but they, they made a hole so she could talk to her dad who was there, obviously very distraught. And he was he put his he could get his hand through to her, but she was dying. So he held her hand and talked to her as she was dying. And her last words were, I love you, Daddy. And she just kept saying she loves her daddy. And then she died. In very sad circumstances, but they asked the father afterwards, you know, do you hate the people who killed her? And he said, well, it's hard to have hatred in your heart when your daughter has just given you love and taught you love. Many people found that very uplifting story, even though it's a tragedy. Uh, we, our aim is to find love, even in the worst situations, because that's what frees the mind, liberates the mind from hatred, from anger and also bringing the mind to accept the impermanence of life unfortunately sometimes young people die middle aged people die, old people die but we all have to die eventually getting to know that clearly in your mind so you're, you can accept it when your mind 
accepts the truth and it goes peaceful. Doesn't want death, doesn't want impermanence, but it accepts it because that's the way it is. You know, that's, that's spiritual maturity, accepting the inevitability of the end of life. And it makes you very energetic to use your time, doesn't it, while you have it. Spurs you on to practice more because you know you don't have much time. You need that on these cold mornings in, if you're in Melbourne. <laughs> Remind yourself, maybe this is the last day of your life. Get up, don't waste your time sleeping, don't waste your, waste your time brooding, self-aversion, aversion for others. <laughs> Don't waste your time with that. Your, your life is better than that. Work at it to let go of the negativity. Work at it to bring up the energy. Don't give in to the, to the anger. Don't give in to the laziness, the stubbornness. And try and bring up the insight and the impermanence of life so that you, have, you make use of your day. So I'll leave you with these reflections tonight. Um.